Uh, oh, he's waking up. Good morning, Robin. Mm. We're live. Good morning. Oh, and I heard a I heard a rooster crow just now. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So um, I'm really, really happy to be speaking to you on your birthday. Happy birthday. And Thank you. I, <laughs> and for those of you who might not know, Robin Lim, Ibu Robin, lives in Bali where she cares for mothers and babies. And if you could just tell us about yourself, what do you do? Who are you? <laughs> well, let's see. I'm a midwife, but I'm also a doula. Uh, I, I think I was a midwife 20 years when I decided that being a doula was super important. And uh, so for you doulas out there, I'm with you. Um, we have had, I, I haven't checked in this morning, but as of last night, there were 25 babies born at Bumi Sehat Clinic in Bali. Um, last month there were 34. That was kind of a slow month. Um, we usually do about 40 a month. Um, we have, um, a general, um, community health clinic as well as, uh, we do food distribution now with 80% or more unemployment here. Um, we have a youth education center, which is mostly on hold except for our online classes so that people in Bali, especially the teenagers can get some classes so they can get better jobs, you know, computer skills, English language or Japanese or Italian, any language they want to learn. If we have a volunteer, we'll, we'll use them. Um, um, we, you know, our prenatal yoga classes with the pandemic are online, except for we do twice a week, just 10 mothers. Um, Previous to the pandemic, we were doing 50 to 80 mothers twice a week uh, coming to prenatal yoga, and all our services are free or by donation. Um, prenatal care, um, I think because the hospitals are so um, scary for people in this day and age, uh, our prenatal care is super, super busy, um, and we, we are able to distribute um, really good quality vitamins for free. We're really blessed that way. Um, what else? Uh, we, we have elder yoga, which again is on hold for the pandemic, but we're doing a feeding program. We find that the elder people in Bali, when there's not enough food at home because there's no income, um, the elders will make sure that the grandchildren and the great grandchildren are fed and they won't eat. So uh, every day of the week, we're able to bring a beautiful uh, lunch box. We have uh, these plastic lunch boxes so that we, we pick up the clean one and drop off the, the new one every day. And it's an opportunity to do health checks. A nurse goes with whoever's distributing the food that day all around the villages. Um, a nurse goes with them and checks blood pressure and temperature and makes sure that our elders are just keeping a pulse on their health. Um, the elders in Bali are a really important part of our lives. So um, this pandemic, we've been really worried about them. We've been blessed because we really don't have that much of a problem compared to other places. I mean, yes, there have been deaths and friends have died, but not as it has been in, in uh, North America and Japan and, you know, different Europe. So we, we're really blessed here. I probably it's all the vitamin D. I hope, I hope it continues this way. It seems to be surging right now, but, um, we try to do a model of healthcare that is respectful. Uh, there just doesn't seem to be any reason for anyone to be disrespected in childbirth, no matter what is happening, whether they're low risk or high risk, everyone deserves love and respect. And it's difficult now because one of our big things is we hug everyone and now we're not allowed to hug. So even when we wear these hazmat suits and plastic face shields and a mask and a head cover and feet cover. And, you know, of course we've always worn gloves, but now we have this situation where the, the mothers can't see our smiles, but they can see our eyes and we can rub their backs. The government's requiring a rapid um, COVID-19 test for every mother in labor. And we have a lab here on site so we can do it. And it's a 15 minute process. But during that 15 minutes, the mothers are so afraid that they'll get a positive test. Even if they don't have any symptoms, they're afraid of that positive test because if they get a positive test, they're required to go to the hospital and have the baby where they'll be separated. And it's a terrible, terrible fear. 
And uh, so we hold those mother's hands and we tap their hearts and we reassure them that so far, none of our mothers in labor have come up positive. We've been really blessed. Um, but it's a, that 15 minutes, they, they tell us is the longest 15 minutes because they're in labor, they're having contractions and they want their baby in their arms. They don't want their baby separated from them. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, we, we know that's true across all cultures, that every mother wants her baby skin to skin with her right after the birth. Yeah. So we, we try to maintain the most beautiful model of care possible. You've been here, Nikki, so you, uh, I have, you and know, I, I, I remember being in, being in, in the big area there and, and one of the other midwives coming in with one of our young moms who was really, really nervous and, and that midwife was just dancing with her and, and she had her baby early the next morning because she was just so happy and so she felt so loved. We're having a hard time mm. here in, in Montreal, particularly because the hospitals have closed their doors to doulas. Um, so many of the doulas that I, that I taught are doing virtual care during birth. And, mm -hmm. and it's, 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 it's really difficult for the mothers. It's really difficult. It's taking away the, their love and support that they would have. And I don't think it's yeah. for the, I don't think it's for real scientific reasons, to be honest. Um, it's part of the whole machinery that works against birthing mothers. Um, mm -hmm. But let's get back to you. You are having a birthday today and every year on your birthday, I know that you have a campaign because you don't yes. really want gifts for yourself. So can you tell us a little bit about your campaign? <laughs> Uh, so this year, um, we've partnered with Global Giving, which has been really a blessing because they amplify all the gifts to Bumi Sehat. So I'll send you the link. Um, I'll, I can send it to you and then you can send it to anyone who's watching. Um, so it's Global Giving and, um, and they have a big grant so that the, for every organization that gets donations through global giving on December 1st, which is next week. Actually, it's in a few days. Yeah, it's next yeah. week. So I'm asking people to hold my birthday. Let's postpone my birthday till December 1st. And then small donations go a long way. You know, we're, we're a grassroots organization and every single, every single penny counts. So, um, when you give through global giving, it amplifies your gift. So that's really exciting. We're hoping, we're hoping to get some breathing space during this campaign, you know, just to, to know that for the next few months, we don't have to worry about laying anybody off. We don't have to worry about, we haven't laid anyone off in, in the four clinics in Indonesia and two in the Philippines, we've kept everybody on. Um, and so that's really important to us because hotels and restaurants, you know, when they, when the when the customers start com San stop coming, stop coming. What's up, audio? I have to tell my midwife in Hawaii that caught my babies that I can't talk. Hold on. <laughs> Hi, Jenny. Hi. Hi. I can't talk right now. Can you hear me? Oh, thank you. I can't talk right now. I'm online with a whole lot of doulas and mommies and grandmothers and <laughs> and midwives and birth keepers i love you i love you so much i'll talk to you later bye <laughs> midwives they that call yeah she calls me at least once or twice a week to make sure i'm okay and i call her yeah so i'm, I'm not sure where oh. i was <laughs> um, you were talking to us about the campaign and everyone's going to wait until December 1st. Um, yes, thank Robin, you. it's funny about December 1st. Uh, when you stayed in my house in Montreal, you, I have a picture of you sitting on the couch with my sister. So it's her birthday on December 1st. So there's all a big circle of good oh, things. Oh, yeah. wow. I still, I still remember that incredible time that we were together. You were your family. I miss all of them. Are they all good? We miss you too. Yes. Everyone's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had to close um, your, your coffee shop? And we closed cafe? for a little while. 
um, and mm -hmm. it was really great because we closed from March 13th until the end of May. So I was living in my mm -hmm. house with my husband and and uh, two of the kids and my nephew. And I basically, because I had gone away from both, and mm. I sat in my basement and meditated and realized that I needed to go back. So this is good. It was it was good to close for a minute. It's good for all the mothers and the babies too. Yeah. yeah. So I just yeah, want to tell everyone that's listening that that honestly, giving money to Bumi Sehat means giving money to some of the poorest people and the most um, humble and the neediest people, and that money goes straight there. If I give you ten dollars, mm -hmm. uh, Robin, where is it? Where will it go? How? What will that go towards? Oh, things like uh, ten dollars will cover the rapid test for a mom. Um, there we go. So you cover... see, here That's I know in Europe that rapid test costs something like four hundred euros. So, really, if you only Ooh. have ten dollars to give, then save it till December first, and 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 till December 1st and and that money will go to a really good place and as you can see Robin isn't living in the lap of luxury she's living in the lap of luxury but not of like <laughs> that kind of luxury so so yeah. please be generous um mm. so I want to ask Leave you this is more luxury. of a it is luxury it's, it's luxury a certain here. type of luxury yeah we keep waiting um, for your family to come back. <laughs> we're going to. We're going to. We have some things to do, but we're coming back. I want to ask you an interesting question. One of the um, traditional birth companions that I was speaking to told me that um, she's noticed that babies are acting differently in the womb and that uh, labors are a little bit different. She thinks that everyone, just the the effects of the pandemic on moms and babies is pretty profound. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that in your birthing mothers at all? I I have, and I feel like the, the cortisol, the, the hormone of sorrow that we all have coursing through our bodies right now. Uh, I try not to, I try not to think about it too much, you know, and I feel like if every, every smile, every time we touch a mother on the arm, even though we can't hug her, Every time we rub her back, every time we tell her in prenatal care, this is not prenatal scare, it's prenatal care. And we reassure her. And just by saying that to her, she knows that we acknowledge that she is afraid and, and she can smile and put that aside. Uh, yesterday I did two interviews with women's groups here in Indonesia and they're all terrified and, you know, to have several dozen expecting mothers and their doulas and their midwives online together. Um, it was just, I'll tell you the most profound first time I realized that this pandemic is having such a harsh effect on mothers. I, um, I made my way to the U S last July. Uh, my daughter was expecting to come home to have her second baby. Uh, she was a V back mom. She had a belly birth with the first baby because the placenta abrupted. Uh, we think that it had to do with living in Santa Rosa, California, where the climate crisis fires are happening. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we had a two minute transport to the hospital from, uh, from our labor that was going beautifully. She was seven centimeters and suddenly something was very wrong. And um, being very organized and prepared, my daughter, um, you know, we went smoothly to the hospital. And the nurses there, uh, there were no midwives except the midwives that were with me and myself, but the nurses there were so beautiful. And they told us that they had seen that week already four abrupt placentas. And that was due to the climate crisis fires. They feel like the water table in that area with a third of the buildings having been burned is so full of toxins. I mean, I noticed that my hair was falling out in handfuls every time I washed my hair there. So, Two years earlier, my daughter had had an um, emergency belly birth and she absolutely wanted to have a VBAC, of course. And um, she was coming home to Bali to do that because she felt like, you know, we're family friends with Dr. Hariasa. If she had to have an emergency transport again, she'd want that kind of a greeting 
at the hospital, I was shocked at the harshness of the greeting at the hospital in California. Um, I just did not experience that here. I felt like the medical challenges here are many, but the medical challenge in California of being my, being the way my daughter was treated was, and I, I feel like she's a woman of color. She had abrupting placenta. They felt like it was drugs and they wanted to wait two more hours before the emergency emergency life-saving belly birth cesarean. They wanted to wait before they would do this belly birth for her. And I insisted that we go straight into surgery. I mean, my, my grandson's heartbeat was dropping to 70 and even once 40. So we needed to get into surgery and thank heaven for that surgery. It saved his life. And he's a beautiful, amazing two-year-old now. And when my daughter became again pregnant and she was so happy and then the pandemic just the news started to unfold and she was planning to be back here by may but by you know the 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 airports were closing the visas were impossible she could not get home and so i got i got there and just the things like driving by the hospital to see where we would have to go we all went to her sister's big, beautiful house, which is like a sanctuary in Texas. But driving by that Austin hospital and just to see where she'd have to go if she needed a repeat cesarean was so frightening because we talked to them from the car on the phone and they said, well, you would have to send her in. You could walk to the door, but you could nobody could come with her. And I said, well, what about her husband? And they said, if we have no COVID patients on that day, we would allow her husband in but they have COVID patients every day, every night, all day. So we could see that she would have to go through those doors alone. And she was determined and she had a long, difficult labor. And I was really blessed because um, Cassandra Jaw, who's a midwife in Austin um, came in and supported us. She was almost the doula for the midwife because at one point I was just in tears but I saw the layers of stress that my daughter was so worried about going to that hospital and having her baby exposed. And, um, and, and when you talk about the baby's behavior, she kept telling me this baby is a hundred times more active than, than my first baby. And I kept saying, really? And I touch her belly and I'd say, well, yeah, that's a pretty active baby. And for a while the baby kept becoming posterior. And she kept doing hands and knees and through her entire labor, she was hands and knees in the shower. And I think we used up all the water in Austin. Um, anyway, she, she did push her baby out absolutely incredibly. Her husband held her up and she was in a full squat and she pushed her baby out and that baby's cord was around her neck five times. I've never seen five. I've seen four twice in a lot of births. I'm talking a lot, a lot of births. I've seen twice, only four times. I've seen three times, maybe four or five times. I've seen one time or two times, uh, you know, quite common. We're, we're used to that a lot, but five times tight. And I realized the wisdom of mother's bodies. We've seen it every time we've got a tight cord around the neck. We, we can hear it. Usually the midwives will say, Ibu Robin, will you come in and I'll walk down the street to the clinic and they'll say, will you come in because we feel like we hear a cord and we want to make sure that we have extra midwives, experienced midwives on hand. And I say, sure, sure, no problem. And um, we find that the mother's bodies will slow that labor right down. I mean, my daughter with her first labor, uh, she got to seven centimeters and just, to, you know, I don't know, really classic, you know, five or six hours, just straight to seven centimeters. And then all hell broke loose when we, her placenta started to give up. And again, that's, we think it's because of the pollution there. But, um, but with this baby, she was in labor, kind of early, nice, gentle labor all day. And then, and we were at home, so it was really relaxed. And then all through the night and slowed way, 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 way down. And um, I've never, I've never done five before. I hope I never have to, but I will say that, you know, the doula part of me was just 
shocked at what I had to do as a midwife in that moment that, you know, everything was fine. The baby's heartbeat was perfect, perfect. Um, you know, we, we started to listen between contractions, just, you know, here she is squatting. We have a baby on view. Everything's going good. And then the baby pretty much just sits on the perineum, like in a half crown and nothing happens. And then, and the heart tones dropped to 40. And so I did not hesitate. I just looked at my daughter. I said, I'm doing an episiotomy. And the shocking thing of being a midwife who's a gentle birth advocate, and then suddenly you're doing an episiotomy on your own daughter. And she said, mommy, do it. I know you need to. She said that. Mm -hmm. And I cut her and we hauled that baby out. And I said, the next contraction, you cannot wait. You don't have another minute. You have to do it. And she got her baby out and I started unwinding that cord five times and baby was great considering how, how depressed her heartbeat was in that last minute. She came, you know, a little bit of stimulation straight to her mommy's chest. We kept stimulating her. She was perfect. And um, she actually had bruises on her neck for the first two days of her life. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think that um, my I think that the, the crisis is, is, is showing all of us to do these, these difficult things that we never imagined that we would do. And my daughter said, you know, to her daughter, when she was a couple days old, she said, Joanna, you really, you really did respond to this pandemic. She twisted herself up five times like that. I mean, exactly, how, yeah. how is it? And thank heaven for long cords and be yeah. sure Julie's to tell all your moms to make those long cords. And one of the things we find, and I saw an Australian research project that showed that in times of strife, the cords will be shorter. So we need to fight that by eating lots of vegetables and fruits. Um, when you peel your oranges, you know how there's those little strings, the little white strings? People peel those off and throw them away. They need to eat those. That's the pectin in the fruit. They need to turn part of that orange peel inside out and eat, eat the orange whites, the white part of the orange peel. Because we've had mothers who have had a really, really, really short cords in previous births have super long cords by doing that. So, um, yeah, eat those strings of your orange, eat the, eat the, eat the talipusar, the, the umbilical cords of the oranges and eat the white part and do it every day. You know, try, try as a pregnant mother to do the little things every day, because I believe it's the little things that are the solution. It's the little things, but also the big things. I'm getting lots of mothers call me these days and they don't want to go to the hospital. That's a big thing. That's a big thing. Big, big That's thing. a big thing. Yeah. I mean, and I'm the, also, you know, getting... go, go ahead, ahead, Nikki. Not that. So I, mean... I... go ahead. <laughs> sorry. I'm going to wait. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not a big thing to to give birth outside of the hospital, but it is a big thing to give birth uh, if outside the hospital if you want a midwife and you can't find one, or you're not sure about giving birth outside of the hospital. So all of these choices should be choices that you can make to have a safe and sacred birth rather than that is forced upon you. Yes. I, I'm getting emails from all over the world from mothers saying, I had my first baby in Bali and Bumi Sehat and we're, we're in our own country now and we don't have the support we need. We can't, the midwives are over, overbooked. Uh, I had one mother in Australia. It was, uh, beginning of July and she called me on her birthday and she'd been in labor already for 24 hours with her second baby. And she said she was attempting a, a home birth alone. Mm -hmm. And I called a midwife friend in Australia and I said, remember all the times you said you'd do anything for me? <laughs> and you know what? It turned out she was, she's actually an American midwife who got blessed to be stuck in Australia. She was in Australia on her way somewhere else uh, when the, when the airports closed. And so she, um, 
she was 20 minutes from my friend and she went to Bernice's house and it was a blessing. Bernice's baby was very asynclitic and very afraid to come. Mm -hmm. And, and Bernice needed a midwife, you know, I mean, when, when, when Augustina came to her door, she fell to her knees in tears. She was so happy. And she ended up having a beautiful birth at home in the water uh, with her husband catching as she had hoped for. Um, and she needed some stitches, her, her perineum tore. She had a really big baby and um, she, and she needed some help in many ways. Um, little things like she said that she thought breastfeeding would be no big deal for her, but she needed her midwife slash doula to help her with getting the baby well on the breast. The first few times she said, I, she kept calling me and saying, I was shocked at how much I needed someone that I thought I didn't need. And the Australian health system was encouraging her not to come if she didn't want to come, but um, they didn't have a provision for home birth the way they have in England. And um, they did come and do uh, postpartum visits for her in the days following um, the, the, the national health system midwives in Australia, but they could not come to her birth and the, uh, and the, home birth midwives in Australia were overbooked and she didn't have the money. Her husband's Balinese. We have wood carvers behind our house at work now. <laughs> we, um, we don't have, we, we, we don't have enough midwives here in Quebec and Canada. Well, all across Canada really, but particularly in Quebec. So women are giving birth to, without anyone there. They're giving birth with uh, just a doula present. They're giving birth in all sorts of ways. And, yeah. um, and many of the women that, uh, that are actually birthing in the hospital, um, are having doulas present only virtually. And I'm really interested in that. And I think that you'll understand I'm right now. I do every Sunday. I do a herb walk with about 15 women from all over. And it's just a virtual, uh, I've just been introducing them to my favorite herb friends. And what I've been doing, mm. what I've started doing is just picking up the herb and showing it to them. And I'm sure that, you know, we don't understand so much. I'm sure that even, I'm sure that you and I right now are exchanging oxytocin. We're absolutely <laughs> This is true. That. So, this so is true. I think we need to have a little bit more, um, you know, the, the thing that a doula does and a midwife and a mother and a grandmother, what we all know how to do more than anything is we know how to adapt and we know how to, uh, you know, use what we have at hand. So right now we have, we have the, uh, we have this, we have virtual companionship mm -hmm. and we're mm -hmm. using it. We are really using it. I'm doing virtual prenatals right now. Obviously, it's lovely to be able to touch someone, but if we can't, then this is, I'd love to give you a hug right now, but it's a, <laughs> it's a miracle that we can speak thousands and thousands of miles away. It is a huge blessing and a miracle. It is. And I have had mothers report that their, their doula on their, uh, their iPad or whatever their devices, their doula, their device doula got them through and yeah. really made a huge difference in the hospital. Uh, yeah. It's, I mean, it's difficult far, for the doula. Far, far from ideal. That's for sure. Far what was ideal. ideal was the kind of care that I saw that I saw in, um, at Bumi Sehat. And I have to chuckle Robin, because when you said the average was something like, what did you say your average for monthly births is? 40, 40 in yeah, Bali. And, do you remember when I was there for six weeks? We were doing sometimes 70, 60 a month. Wasn't that, was that that crazy yeah. time? Yeah. 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 The birth, so, birth rate was very. Babies know. Um, babies know. I just, a I lot of women to... are fucking pregnant now. They're, they're oh, yeah. home from work. In Bali as so well. the numbers of prenatals, yes, the numbers of prenatals are on the rise. Um, 
We find that with all the disasters, when our volcano was erupting, everybody went home and got pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like do, right? predictable human response, you know, yeah. uh, the end of the world is here. We better make a baby quick. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So has, the uh, has the pandemic really affected, um, how the clinic works in terms of, um, birthing mothers? How, how is it different? Um, I, I feel like it's the same, I, the wearing the, the PPEs has been um, a something new and something foreign. And I, I feel like it scares mothers a little bit, even though mm -hmm. they know and trust their, their midwives. But we have a certain number of mothers every month who, who walk in cold. They've never had one prenatal visit anywhere. Mm -hmm. They've heard about Bumi Sehat sometimes in the beginning of labor and they've rushed over from all parts of the island. So uh, it's, but what they hear again and again is Hey, it's cleaner at Bumi Sehat. It's less crowded. Uh, they they don't have any any COVID patients. You know, we do have people walk in off the street and test and come up positive for COVID because we do free COVID tests. Um, but they immediately get taken um, to where they belong. If they're asymptomatic, of course they don't belong in quarantine in a government facility. Uh, it just, Dr. Dayu is an incredibly compassionate, skilled, beautiful. She's so beautiful inside and out that you feel calm just looking at her. Uh, and she's a mother, a young mother, and she's a brilliant doctor. And she takes care of every single patient so individually. Um, so we're, you know, just trying to make sure everybody feels safe and healthy. We have our HIV positive patients that we're of course concerned about. We have a counselor for them. Um, not long ago, we had a mother walk in and um, she had had no prenatal care and she was not well. Uh, it was just before the pandemic and um, she, you know, she had had no lab tests. We asked her if she wanted her lab tests done. She was in early labor with her first baby. She did and it turned out she was HIV positive. Um, she was living in one room, her and her husband, with 17 people. And so we rented them a little house. That's the kind of thing that your donations help with. Because no one should be living with 17 people. And no young woman should be selling herself se as, as a sex worker as, as little as she could. But she did do that. She told us she did. But she was selling her body um, for food for her and her husband while she was pregnant. So um, this is the kind what, of thing we what might we don't prepare. understand with uh, with giving, even while we're having we might be having a tough time here with the pandemic, but giving just a little bit, just your. I have people coming in my cafe spending thirty dollars on lunch. Just send it over there and oh, yeah it'll be so needed yeah we i feel so blessed i feel like every single night when i tuck into a clean dry bed and i know that so many of our mothers don't have sheets they don't own sheets you know we've we've trained the hotels to give us their sheets when they want to replace them and uh so we get truckloads of sheets and we distribute them all over bali to families that are sleeping on a bare mattress um, and there is a sweetness though about bali with without tourism i mean all the all the the gardens the vegetable gardens are looking beautiful because people have time now they're not working uh the mothers who are so afraid about where their next meal is coming from i remind them that yes if you if you need food just come for lunch at bumi say hi bring the children and I say, how are the children during, do, doing during the pandemic? And they say, they're amazing. They're so happy. I mean, I see the children in the soccer field running and screaming and flying kites. And um, they love having their parents home. Uh, yeah. They do. Uh, my friends in Italy, you've probably seen this in Italy, when Italy was so bad. Uh, friends in Italy started doing a campaign of exchanging pictures of themselves with their children because in the photos, the children were ecstatic. And yeah. so, yeah, it's those little things that 
um, and and the creativity, the people, you know, the woman who comes around who says, five years ago I had my baby at Bumi Sehat and now I'm making tempeh at home. Would you like to buy some? And so, of course, I'd like to buy some. And then I get on the I get on the phone to everybody I know who could afford to buy tempeh, and I say, please buy her tempeh. You know, I'm going to buy a whole bunch. You know, she can drop it off every week. And uh, people are just bringing around their their vegetables from their garden, offering to sell it. They're, everyone's trying to do something, um, just something creative at home that they can do. They can't sell handicrafts anymore to the tourists, uh, but, they, but they're trying to do something. Mm. And, uh, and they're, they're also really um, shy about coming for free medical care and free midwifery services. And we keep reassuring them, look, we love what we do and there are plenty of people in the world who support it so please don't be shy yeah, for sure. uh, yeah and the and the expats that live here that are having babies and seems a lot of them are um they're being really generous so it's great it's it's a way of subsidizing someone who you may have met her in your prenatal yoga class you know and now you're able to donate enough to pay for you know, one person giving birth that's an expat often donates enough for four or five people to give birth and to cover all our expenses. So that's, I, I feel like inspired single day by what our team is doing there and the love that the midwives share. Um, our team in Papua has suffered really badly. You know, um, a, a family in Papua gave Bumi Sehat land on the condition that we would build a clinic. And I'm like, well, that's a questionable gift <laughs> because then I had to find the money. And um, a friend in Japan uh, was recently widowed and his wife's last message to him in her last words that she could speak uh, were, I never could have children and I want to help mothers with children. Will you take my money? And, and she died with a lot of money. She said, will you take my money and give it to a cause that will support mothers and babies. And literally a few days later, he happened to run into a friend who showed him a film of one of our Papuan uh, women who made her way to Bumi Sehat because she couldn't get, um, she couldn't get a, a vaginal birth after cesarean. She was, she was forced to have a cesarean when she appeared eight centimeters dilated at her hospital because certain days of the week um, the medical schools send their students to Papua to practice, the student surgeons, uh, because Papuans are black and black lives in Indonesia are harder. The darker your skin, the curlier your hair, the harder your life will be here. Mm -hmm. And so as a Papuan, she was forced to have a cesarean she didn't need. And with her second baby, she was terrified that she would have another one with, that she didn't need. And again, I feel like saying to all those um, belly birth moms out there, thank you. Um, it's, it's not easy to have a belly birth. It's not easy to recover from it. But even more difficult is if, if the women feel bad that they did something wrong, you know, uh, let's just bless those mothers and say thank you for your service to your baby and, and to humanity for, for doing whatever you needed to do to have your baby and get your baby earthside. But Raquel, um, as a Papuan woman, really did not want to have another uh, cesarean. So she and her husband saved money for months. And she came to Bumi Sehat. And she stayed in my house, actually. She had nowhere to live. And she stayed in my house. And she had a four kilo baby by a beautiful vaginal birth. And um, she's since had, now she has had her fifth baby. She, her, her father and her two uncles gave land to Bumi Sehat to build. And our friend uh, Maru Yamasan, his wife had died and left him money. And he built the clinic with 100% his funds. And um, that clinic opened last Christmas on Christmas Day. Mm. And it was great because uh, a lot of Papuans are Muslim and a lot of them are Christian. And uh, it happened to be a Christian woman walked in the minute the doors opened and had her baby quickly oh, on gosh. Christmas day. That was our first baby. Yeah. Um, they're really busy there. They're super busy. Um, and the COVID situation in Papua is really dire. 
Uh, mm. Five Why of our midwives, ha- midwives uh, they just, they just, they're getting it there. I don't know if they have a, a stronger strain, but it seems to me like the Papuan people have a more higher incidence of diabetes. I think the stress that they live under um, is, is under, and the poverty and the malnutrition is even more acute than it is here. Um, four of our midwives had um, COVID and recovered and are back at work now. Uh, one of them got COVID and died quickly. Um, they also have malaria there and she had, had, yeah, yeah. Farida is, she spent all of February living in our house, doing special gentle birth trainings. She was the most senior midwife on our team. Um, she did suffer from, uh, she had had falciparium malaria previously. So that was always a preexisting condition. Although she recovered from malaria, it's always there. And so when she got the COVID, it, it was quick. She left three beautiful daughters um, and a husband who's just grieving uh, and, a, and a community that needed her because not only do we have the birth center there in Papua, but they go out, there's, there's a lake there and there are people on those little tiny islands that have absolutely no care at all in pregnancy and the maternal and infant mortality rate is so high so we go by boat our team goes by boat out there weekly and checks on all the mothers and brings them vitamins and food if they need food i mean they they try their best but the soil is really infertile on those little islands so it's hard to scratch out a living um they do eat the fish from the from the uh, lake but um and then they 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 sometimes are able to, especially the first time moms contact us and we'll bring a boat immediately or they'll meet us at the docks on our site and come for birth. Nobody wants to give birth alone here. I don't feel like any woman really wants to give birth alone in the world. It, it breaks my heart when mothers say they're gonna have a home birth unattended, don't have a midwife. Um, it's also hard on I the doulas, people, don't you? Well, I think that women are afraid they don't want um, they don't want a midwife or a doula or a doctor or anyone coming in there and telling them what to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as a midwife, you have to you have to be respectful, and if you don't have that birthing mother at the very center of the experience, then she's gonna feel threatened. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. I wanted yeah. to ask you, what's the status? I pretty much uh, don't have that. I just have a, one more, two more little questions to ask you. What's the status right now for volunteers? Is there any way people can volunteer? How can people volunteer for you now during the during the pandemic? Well, there's no tourism, so you can't even come into the country unless you Is buy a super volunteering. Uh, not really, because most of, remember, most of our mothers don't have a computer. Uh, they do, have, most of them have the a hand. And you mentioned the English, the English classes English. as well? Yeah, the English classes, um, pretty much we can't have them in the classroom. They, um, We have one teacher who's been working for us the longest, and he does online English courses for them, so we're keeping him employed. But, um, yeah, in in the birth rooms... Yeah, the mothers are, they, the midwives, we have a lot of midwives on staff. So we have that doula care built in. Um, all of them have either taken part of or or plan to take or taken all of um, the Ypres doula courses that Deborah Pascali Bonaro and I, yeah, we always um, spend time there with the midwives. Um, and then we scholarship in several of, of any, any Indonesians that want to apply, we try to scholarship them in. Um, we really fill up with a lot of them, and it's great because it keeps us um, it keeps us bilingual in the in the um, yeah. doula training. But um, and and so that you know, there's so much love and compassion. And when you're working with four midwives on shift, and you've only got two mothers in labor, it's really nice because then you do have your doula care. We are allowing the mothers to bring one person in with them, and that's what the government says we're allowed to do. But they always bring more than one. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, you've got to have your husband and your mother there. And if you're a single mother, you certainly do need your mother and your sister. And um, single mothers are really, really have a hard time here in this society. So we're especially attentive to them. 
Um, so there's always, you know, the doula who is a midwife also in the room um, for the, for the, we have a lot of Russian moms right now. And um, for the Russian moms and English speaking moms or the, you know, ones from Europe or Japan, they often have a friend that's um, studied to be a doula that they've connected with during their, their pregnancy. And of course she can come, um, you know, we have a, we have a list of names of people who've studied to be doulas or who are devoted doulas. Um, and we have their phone numbers and they sometimes get called in the middle of the night because there's a language mm -hmm. barrier and we want to make sure. And that I learned from you, you know, that, that, that your program of the, of, yeah. of the doulas there in Canada, um, being available to mothers in labor that, that touched me so deeply. And so we do keep a, a list of doulas that speak different languages. It's really something when, uh, also for women here that are married to Balinese or Indonesian men, and um, they they and they come from other countries. They really want someone in the room that speaks Japanese if they're Japanese or Italian if yeah. they're Italian. Um, yeah, it makes a huge difference. To yes, yeah. that's why it's called the mother tongue. Yeah. Exactly. My mother, had, my mother is here. She's 88 and she had a, a second stroke while I was in the U S when I was receiving my granddaughter into the world. And, um, I found she's back a hundred percent or more, 200%. She's totally fantastically healthy now, but it was, she was very close to death's door. I mean, she was seeing spirits and she, uh, she was having a very hard time when I returned from, um, from um, America to, to be with her, but she, um, she could, she could speak Ilocano, which is her mother tongue. You know, she's, she's Filipino. And, uh, she, I, my Ilocano is really bad. My father didn't want her to speak to us in her mother tongue. So I, that's one of the, that's probably the only real true horrible sadness of my childhood is that my mother didn't speak to us in her mother tongue. Um, but I can understand quite a lot. And under duress, I was able to speak to her a little bit. And she could understand without her hearing aids in clearly her mother tongue. In yeah, English, tongue. she cannot hear without those hearing aids. I think yeah. she blocks it. Well, so, I know that um, it's hard for me to speak French in my cafe, I have to say. My mother tongue's English. My second mother tongue's Italian. Mm -hmm. Actually, my third mother tongue mm -hmm. is Swahili because that's what I learned when I was a baby. But French? Yes. I want to ask you one final question. Um, I just want to let everyone know again, I'm going to remind everyone that Ibu Robin's 64th birthday campaign is on now because today's her birthday. But don't send any money until December 1st. And I'm going to be sending you all out emails and messages and Facebook messages and everything to remind you with the link. Thank if you, you only have $5 to give, give it because it's, it's one of the most valuable, valuable, valuable services. Ibu, send your, uh, show your t-shirt and let everyone read it. Can you see it? Oh, move over. <laughs> Gentle, move. gentle. Okay, basically, wait. it says gentle birth heals Mother Earth. This is true. Say, another, another happy birthday. I just have to turn that off. I'll call her back. Yes, it says I'm gentle birth heal, oh, heals Mother Earth. I can't. I can't do this. There you are. It's back. Gentle birth heals oh. Mother Earth. Yes. One one last question for you. One word. One word for everyone, mm. one word that you would want everyone to, to leave this, this little chat with one word that you give out to the world. Love. <laughs> Had a feeling. Love. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm. Ibu. Thank you. I love you. I love you too. I love you. <laughs> Happy birthday. Bye. Send my love to everyone. Thank you. I love you. I will. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.